just how good can the New York Jets be in 2022? That's what we're talking about in today's Jake Asman show. My guest is former New York Jet and current SNY Jets analyst, Leger Doosable. So let's hit it and get it started. Hit it! Welcome in, everyone. My name is Jake Asman. This is the Jake Asman Show. <laughs> The Jets just had one of their greatest wins in the last 20-something years, and we're going to break it all down. Zach Wilson, Robert Sala, C.J. Mosley, Joe Douglas, Elijah Moore, Jermaine Johnson, Sauce Gardner, Garrett Wilson. I think this is an excellent pick. A super chat, you cut the line. Smash the like button down below. That's that thumbs up icon. Now, let's talk about the New York Jets. <laughs> Here we go on another edition of the Jake Asman Show. It is Friday. It is May 20th, 2022. As we get things rolling here at the start of a new program, I'm not going to waste any time. Let's bring on our guest. He's one of the best when it comes to talking NFL. He's a big national star now, national radio show on Sirius XM's Mad Dog Sports Radio. And, of course, Jet fans, you watched him play. And you watch him on SNY's pre- and post-game coverage of the Jets. Leger Doosable joins us now Leger what's going on man what's up Jake how you doing I'm great I'm great I appreciate you coming on Leger there's a lot to talk to you about last time I had you on it was right before the draft so yeah. let's kind of recap a little bit your thoughts on what Joe Douglas and Robert Sala and company did with their draft capital and, and what they turned that capital into I mean Jake what can you say what a draft right this was a draft for the ages I've been saying this was a change the narrative type draft for the New York Jets, and if you just break it down as a whole, to be candid with you, you know, when we picked Sauce Gardner at four and Garrett Wilson at 10, I was like, eh, you know, it was cool. It's a cool draft. Yeah. But when we were able to trade up and get Jermaine Johnson at the 26th spot, that's when it was a home run for me. And, and not to say that Sauce Gardner and Garrett Wilson are great players, right? They were the number one players at their position. Sauce Garner, to me, was the number one corner in this draft class. A guy that can play man-to-man, likes to be on the island, highly competitive, a willing tackler, to me, was the number one corner. Never gave up a touchdown his whole college career. Now, Derek Stingley Jr. might have a higher ceiling, and I'm not going to say might. He does have a higher ceiling, but that's the thing. You just don't know what you're going to get with Derek Stingley because we haven't really seen it since his freshman year. Now, the tape wasn't as bad for Stingley as I originally thought for his sophomore and junior year when he was actually on the field. But it wasn't transcendent like it was his freshman year. So I think that's what the Houston Texans are banking on, you know, him being healthy and being that player he was when they won the national championship. But then Garrett Wilson, to me, was the most complete receiver in this draft class. A a tough guy, a guy that loves football, a guy that can go and get it at the high point, a a really precise route runner. I mean, there were questions about his speed. He he quelled those questions at the combine running in the 4-3 range. And I think he's going to be able to free up Elijah Moore, who I believe will be the Jets' true number one receiver this year. I think he's going to transcend to that number one spot. Jermaine Johnson, to me, has the most upside out of any end in this draft class, right? Um, I hear people talking, he's only a one-year starter, but you got to think, he played on a stacked Georgia defense. And to put it in perspective, three of, three of those other guys went in the first round this year. So there's, <laughs> there's a reason why he wasn't playing that much. Plus, Georgia rotates anyway. So, I mean, Jordan Davis, who went at the number 14 pick, from the defensive tackle was playing only about 25, maybe 30 snaps a game anyway. And he was the starter. So uh, Jermaine Johnson bet on himself, left, went to Florida state because he wanted to be on the field more. So he went from playing about under 30% of the snaps to over 60%. And you saw no drop off, right? This guy plays with elite effort. He fits the mantra of Robert Sala's all gas, no breaks to me, the best edge defender on playing against the run in this draft class. I mean, to get the guy just has heavy hands. He knows how to knock offensive tackles back, get off of them violently, and get to the running back. And then this pass rush game, right? You saw it evolve throughout the year, Jake. Like, in the beginning of the year, he was just really winning with, you know, speed to power. But then you saw him throwing chop clubs. You saw him throwing spins. And it was because he was able to get more comfortable, right? He didn't have as many reps at Georgia. So when you're the starter and you get an uptake in snap count, you can try more things in your pass rush game. You develop your pass rush a little bit more. And that's what happened with Jermaine Johnson. And then it all culminated at the senior bowl 
where this guy put on a pass rush display. I don't think one guy blocked him the whole time he was there. And he was only there for two days, and <laughs> he left after two days because there was nothing else he could have done to, you know, really help his stock in the draft. The only thing he could have did was potentially get hurt and hurt his stock. So he left after two days, and I think – Robert Sala, just talking to him throughout the draft process, I, I I knew he loved Jermaine Johnson. This was a guy they were comfortable taking at the number 10 spot. I thought they would honestly maybe take him even at the number four spot. But uh, what Robert Sala was telling everybody was true. You know, a lot of people just say stuff for PR. But if Garrett Wilson had been taken by Atlanta at eight, the Jermaine Johnson was going to be the pick at 10. So, And then trading up to get Brees Hall. Now, I know a lot of Jet fans and, and personnel people are like, you just don't take running backs that high. Brees Hall is a workhorse. This is a different running back, right? This is a guy, again, that had issues or, or people had questions about his long speed, right? Went to the combine, I believe, ran a 4-3-9. Like, so quell that, right? He's a home run hitter. I talk about workhorse and a finisher, right? 56 touchdowns, Jake. Like, that, that's ridiculous in college. And this is a guy that can run in between the tackles. Pass protection is a major thing in this Mike LaFleur offense from the running back position. This guy will fit it up in there with linebackers blitzing. He will he will chop linebackers down, get them on the ground, and give Zach Wilson some more time. And he's comfortable catching the ball out of the backfield. So it's going to be a nice one-two punch. I eventually think Brees Hall takes over the number one running back spot. I love Michael Carter to death, but he's never been the number one guy, right? And last year, they tried to beat, let him be the number one guy. He got banged up. So I think they take some snaps off him. I think he could potentially be the third down back. While Brees Hall is your, is your you know your workhorse on, on first and second down, and I think they rotate on on third downs because Brees Hall again is good in pass protection and can catch the ball out of the backfield. So I even like what the Jets did later on in the draft. I mean, Jeremy Rucker to me was my favorite tight end. To me, you know, McBride was the best. Trey McBride was the best tight end, but I think Jeremy Rucker was my favorite tight end. Like this guy will hit you in the mouth, Jake. Like like Ron Middleton built an affinity for you know Jeremy Rucker at the senior bowl because Ron Middleton was the head coach and you know he's a tight end position coach so he really loved Jeremy Rucker this is a guy that's athletic too and a lot of people didn't talk about his athletic ability enough because Ohio State had all those receivers so he didn't really get the ball that much in the passing game but when he did man you saw him separate from guys you saw him being able to catch the ball get upfield drop that shoulder on people and he's more elusive than people give him credit for Max Mitchell's another guy I really loved at the senior bowl I think he can have a Doug Free type career. That's the offensive tackle from Dallas Cowboys back in the day. A really solid right tackle for eight to ten years, right? So, you know, with the whole Makai Beckton thing, if he goes over to right tackle and he's not able to be healthy, I'm not saying in year one Max Mitchell is going to be the guy, but I can see him, you know, developing. And, and if something happens and halfway through the year he has to come in, I'm comfortable with that. And even next year I'm comfortable with him being the right tackle. And then, you know, Mike Clements, man, is just a dog. That's the, that's the best way to describe him. He's just a dog, man. I think he's going to fill in perfectly behind John Franklin Myers in that big end position. Just plays with violent hands, man, in, in the run game and in the pass rush game. An older guy, so he's more developed. Uh, I just think they did a really good, uh, solid job. And, you know, this defense is predicated. Robert Sala's defense is predicated off the defensive line creating havoc. You know, people complain that we didn't have enough thoroughbreds in the stable last year. Now we have an abundance of thoroughbreds. One might say we might, we might have too many, but you never know what injuries and anything like that. Um, I mean, at the, just the defensive end position, we got to be like seven, eight deep. Like, and I love it. I love it. I love <laughs> now it. I, I have been waiting to, to talk to you about this draft and specifically the guy that you already talked up big time in this conversation, Jermaine Johnson. I mean, one, yeah. you played for Robert Sala with the San Francisco 49ers, you know, coach Sala as well as anyone mm -hmm. we could bring on this channel. And two, you played the defensive line position. So you're the perfect person to talk about the impact that Johnson can have with Sala in this Jets defense. I mean, what are reasonable expectations for him and how does he open things up for other guys on the defensive line now? Yeah, first and foremost, I think he's the one guy on the defensive line that can play both in positions. When I, when I talk about the big end, right, that's the guy that's usually in the, the wide nine or over the tight end, um, and you want to get knocked back and set the edge, right? The other end is called the Leo open side. That's what Carl Lawson plays. That's the guy. That's your speed end. I think Jermaine Johnson gives you the element where he can play both, right? So you talk about being able to be physical over the tight end. He can do that with his heavy hands, but also on the backside, chasing down the ball carrier from behind. And then in the pass rush game, right, what it does, it frees up John Franklin Myers to rush inside, which is what he wanted to do all last year. We saw glimpses of it in week one versus the Carolina Panthers, right? He made quick work of their interior offensive linemen and, and got to Sam Donald quickly, but he wasn't able to do that as much last year because we didn't have the depth at the defensive end position. Well, now you do, right? You signed Jacob Martin 
in the offseason. You got to essentially say Carl Lawson is part of this free agency class too because we didn't really get to see him play last year. We saw right. him in preseason destroy everybody, right? But they didn't really get to they didn't get to see him play during the regular season. So you got him coming back, right? Now you add Jermaine Johnson, you know, Michael Clemens on the outside. So now and you also people aren't talking about Bryce Huff was having a hell of a year before he got banged up last year. So you have him coming back as well. This is a deep group on the edge. And Robert Sala, like the mantra is all gas, no breaks. He wants guys to go hard for four to six plays, get them off the field, bring in some fresh bodies to continue to attack in the run game and the pass rush game. So Jermaine Johnson is that one guy on the defensive line that can play both in positions. He can play the big end and the Leo. So it's going to free up John Franklin Myers so much. Like I, I, I could see John Franklin Myers – and I said this last year, and it was true, right? I said he's going to be the unheralded star of the defense. Now, the defense didn't play well at all, but John Franklin Myers was a guy I told everybody to circle on the calendars before training camp. He ended up getting the nice deal. Uh, had a hell of a beginning of the season. And if you look at the last game versus the Buffalo Bills, he constantly got pressure on the edge. I mean, Josh Allen is just a, a magician, right? So it wasn't talked about enough. But Josh Allen didn't really play well that last game versus the Buffalo Bills, and a lot of it was John Franklin Myers. So uh, it's going to free him up to, to play so much better. And he's going to be comfortable on first and second downs, knocking the sh out of tight ends, right? And then on third down, being able to use the athletic ability and that strength inside versus guards. I mean, it's going to be magical, I believe, for this defensive line for the Jets. Got to ask you about Carl Lawson. You know, obviously, yeah. you know him well. You played the position. Yeah. What's it going to be like for him coming back from the, you know, the Achilles injury that he suffered and, do you think he could start rusty? I mean, what are fair expectations for Carl Lawson after not playing at all last year? Yeah, I've actually talked to Carl a lot, and uh, he's actually down here in Miami. This offseason he was, you know, training with my physical therapist, Sharif Tabai, and he looks good, man. I mean, what I echo what Robert Sala said, you know, you don't have to worry about Carl. Like, he is a war curse when it comes to rehab, to the weight room. Like, he's going to be ready to go. The thing is, now with Jermaine Johnson, you don't have to rush him back as much. Now, the only thing is, and – this is not me getting messy, Jake, right? I believe this is at his three-year deal. This is like the last year of guarantees, right? Mm -hmm. So I think Carl is going to try to come back quicker because he wants to make sure that, you know, with as deep as this D-line is, we've seen it before when, when guys, you know, coming back from injuries, they play well, but their cap number is so high that teams are still like, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe we actually for a pay cut or make actually to leave. So uh, I'm not sure if that's in the back of his head. I know Carl takes every day in stride. This is a guy that continues to work hard. He's going to be back with vengeance, but with Jermaine Johnson, it gives you the luxury of, you know, maybe easing Carl in the first month and then up in his reps, right? So it'll be interesting to see on first and second down who they start because it kind of reminds me of when the San Francisco 49ers signed D Ford. Same thing happened, right? He got hurt that first year just like Carl did and was out for most of the year. Um, the next year, they drafted Nick Bosa. Right. And Nick Bosa was a guy that could play the run, could play the pass, just like Jermaine Johnson. So it'll be interesting to see will they put Carl Lawson in that D forward like category where they bring him in on third down and then every once in a round on first or second down, you know, give Jermaine Johnson some rest or John Franklin Myers some rest and let him play some rundowns and mainly use him on passing downs where he can really get after the quarterback. Um, because then John Franklin Myers clicks inside. You got Jermaine Johnson on the outside. You have Carl Lawson on the outside and you have Quentin Williams and John Franklin Myers. Like I love that. If that's if that's health if they're all healthy during the season, that's one of the top rushing defenses as far as rushing and getting to the quarterback in the NFL. So it'll be interesting to see how Robert Sala implores that and Jeff Albright um, who will they start on base downs on first and second down? You know, every Jeff fan has been saying for years, oh, we haven't had an edge rusher since John Abraham. Well, now the hope yeah. is that you maybe have two with Lawson coming back and and Jermaine Johnson. Uh, just how much better can this defense be, Lejay? Because it's no secret they were the worst in football last year, 32nd. Yeah. A lot of that had to do, though, I'm sure, new system, injuries. I mean, if they get decent health, and that's a big if with the Jets, as we know, just how, how much better can they be? Like, what are you expecting this defense to do? Like, can they be a top 15 unit, top 10? Is that crazy? I mean, if you think about the turnover, I'll go from team period. I think you're going to get nine new impact starters. Like, when you get that type of turnover, you're expecting, you know, to see the results in the win column when that happens. Um, on defense, I believe five, right? You're talking about you add Carl Lawson because he didn't start last year, right? Carl Lawson or Jermaine, that's, that's one spot. Two new corners a starting new safety. So that's four. So it, it may be five, depending on how they, you know, employ the defensive front. And, you know, I, I've been talking to my guy, Larry Ogunjobi. So if he signs on, that's five to six new starters. On Are you defense. recruiting him to the Jets? Lejay? I've been recruiting him, man. I'm, I'm trying to get my guy. Um, 
uh, it was shitty what happened with him in Chicago, man. Mm-hmm. I feel for him because he had a hell of a year. I seen again, he he trains with my trainer as well, too. Sharif Tabar, physical therapist, one of the best in the game down here in South Florida. Um, it was and for, for when he got hurt too late in the season, in the playoffs, essentially, and essentially that's when he got hurt in the playoffs. Um, he was gonna be the highest paid nose tackle in football, right? And you know, of course he wasn't gonna pass his physical. The man just got hurt. So I I thought that was dirty as hell by the Chicago Bears. Um uh, I just and it just sucks because now as a player, not everybody's gonna look at you like you're damaged good. And he literally just signed a one year prove it deal with the Bengals, right? That was his purpose to do what he did, go out there, handle business, and that's what he did. Then he got, you know, a fluke, you know, incident where he gets hurt, you know, and it was weird because I remember when it happened and he was down. It didn't even look nothing. It didn't look like anything crazy. I don't think his foot got caught up under him or something. Um, but then in free agency, you know, you're going to sign the biggest deal because I think Foley was right up under him. And I think DJ, uh, my guy DJ Jones was right up under him as far as what they were getting yearly basis. And then, you know, the news comes out that, you know, that he didn't p- pass his physical and they, you know, took the deal back. And I'm like, oh, no matter where he goes now, he's not going to get 40% of what they were offering him on a yearly basis now. So it, it kind of sucks for him, but he's he's a tough guy. He'll bounce back and he'll ball out this year wherever he goes. I'm just hoping it's the New York Jets. <laughs> you know, is it something where he's still kind of looking for that long-term deal because that's what he had with Chicago? Or is he yeah. you know, now going to have to probably take a, another prove-it deal, so to speak, to try and you know restore what his value should be? Yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to value. I don't think he minds signing a one year. He just wants to be, you know, financially secure in that one year deal, which everybody does. But you got to understand the, the the business of football, right? Um, when one team puts something out there like that, man, like every other team is going to look at you like it's damaged good. So there, every other team, like any business, is going to try to get as much work for you as as much work from you for as little as pay possible. Right. That's just the way of the world. And I had to learn that in this game early on. Um, and it sucks when you're a player. It's personal for you. Right. You put your time, your heart, um, injuries, everything, blood, sweat and tears. You hear that all the time. It's literally that. And then for a team to tell you this is what your value is and you don't agree with it. It's it's a tough place to be. Um, but again, I wish nothing but the best for my guy later. I just hope he plays with us, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so does every Jet fan watching. Uh, legit, I got to ask you about Zach Wilson, right? Because so much about this offseason was, well, they got to help Zach Wilson. They got to put him yeah. in position to take that year two leap. Before we get to your thoughts on if he could take that year two leap, do you look at what they've done this offseason in free agency in the draft and say, hey, he now has enough around him for us to properly evaluate what he could be as a player? One thousand percent, Jake. I mean, the New York Jets have done more for Zach Wilson than I believe any other Jets quarterback in history. Honestly, <laughs> if you look at it right, um, they say the biggest leap for players in you know in the NFL are from year one to year two. So Joe D, who likes to build it from the ground up, right, the fronts, then back. What does he do, right? Last year he took Zach, but he got him some help. He took Elijah Vera Tucker in the first round with him, who was the best interior offensive lineman in the draft last year guy that has pro bowl potential i believe he'll realize that potential this year i'm saying he's going to be either a pro bowler this year or next year um what what does he also do right he he brings in you know lincoln thomason a pro bowl offensive guard who is very familiar with the system that's played in the system for the last 2017 last five years um so he's very familiar with this so that's going to help a guy like elijah very tucker to have a mentor that's constantly been in this system for the last five years is comfortable with it that's been to two nfc championship games and a super bowl they're bringing in the right pedigree of players in here right you know you hear tight ends all the time talking about that being a safety blanket for the quarterback what did Jess do we bring in three new tight ends we i didn't even know the Jess knew what the tight end was right <laughs> so, <laughs> me so, neither so so we went above and beyond to make sure zach had you know three good tight ends right not just average tight ends they go and get Tyler Conklin, who was a blocking tight end at first that then developed into a really good pass catcher. CJ Uzama, same thing, came in the league as a blocking tight end, developing into a real good uh, pass catcher. Jeremy Rucker, hell of an athlete, but will we'll rip your face off, right? And this is the thing I want people to understand, Jake. They're going to run the football. This team is going to run the football. Like, there's a reason why they traded up to get Brees Hall. There's a reason why they added that many tight ends. There's a reason why they paid $13 million to a Pro Bowl guard. They are going to run the football and take as much pressure off Zach Wilson until he is comfortable to take over the keys of this offense, right? And then they didn't just help him up front. So when you help him and you build the wall in front of the quarterback, right, 
It gets him comfortable in the pocket. He doesn't keep drifting back. A lot of times we saw that last year. Zach kept just drifting back and drifting back. Now he'll feel comfortable to hitch up in that pocket and let that ball go when that back foot hits. And also, let's give him some pass catchers on the outside, right? So we took Zach Wilson last year. We took Elijah Vera Tucker. Let's get Elijah Moore, who a lot of people had as a top 15 pick, right? We get him at the top of the second round. And then we go we go and get the best receiver in this year's draft class in Gary Wilson. We, we signed Corey Davis last year to a nice lucrative deal as a number two receiver. And we bring back an electric return guy and a slot guy in Braxton Berrio. So, like, the Jets have done more for Zach Wilson than any other Jets quarterback, I would say maybe in history, right? So it's on Zach to develop and, and, and take it to that next level. So do you believe in Zach Wilson? Do you think what we saw, you know, down the stretch, specifically maybe the Tampa game where he had a complete game, you know, the lack of turnovers yeah. over the last five games, do you think what he did at the end of the year with not a whole lot around him, he could take that, apply it, get better this offseason, and then, you know, be a totally different player in year two? Yeah, it's all about progress, and we saw that towards the end of the year. Now, every year is different. I try to tell people this. Every year is different. You can't base off what you did at the end of last year going into this year. It's like you start all over. But I know I know I get kind of a, a bad rap a little bit for that for that one comment I had about Zach Wilson in the Tampa Bay game on the quarterback sneak. But if anybody that knows me, if you watch the, the, the pre-draft show uh, when I was on SNY, I was beating the table for Zach Wilson. Like I'm the huge, I'm the biggest Zach Wilson fan because I know the arm strength this guy possesses. I, possesses. I know the athletic ability he possesses. We saw that some of that towards the end of the year, him using his legs more. And I like that Mike LaFour. Now, I'm not saying that becomes a main thing in the offense, right? I don't want Zach getting hit like that. But you have to have that threat, especially in the red zone, of Zach being able to use his athletic ability and run. And we saw that towards the end of the last year. We saw it versus Jacksonville Jaguars. We saw it versus the Houston Texans. This guy is mobile enough where he can use his legs, and he becomes an extra guy that the defense has to account for. Um, and we saw him versus the Miami Dolphins, like get the ball out of his hands and, and you know, complete balls and tight windows. We saw versus the Tampa Bay Bucks. We saw it in the first half versus the Philadelphia Eagles. So I think that that gives you hope, you know, if, if you're the offensive staff and you're the coaching staff, that Zach Wilson was starting to come on towards the end of the year. Now we're actually giving him more protection. We're giving him more weapons, right? It can only go up from here, right? It's all about Zach and his development. And it seems like towards the end of the year, like he started to understand how the offense flowed, right? Instead of just not taking the simple throw and trying to get the home run throw down the field, he would let the ball go. And I think he, I think it really helped when he saw not one, not two, but three other quarterbacks throw for over 300 yards. I mean, Joe Flacco was right there in the Miami game. I think he threw for 291. But, you know, Josh Johnson in three quarters threw for over 300 yards. I mean, Mike. Money, money, Mike threw for over 400 <laughs> yards. This, this damn jersey in the Hall of Fame. Right. So, like, when you see other quarterbacks doing that, and you're supposed to be, you know, the future, the promised one, right? You, you it, I don't want to say it shakes you up, but it's like, damn, if I just live in this offense, I can still throw for 300, you know, yards a game by just getting the ball out of my hands. I think we saw that development in Zach towards the end of the year. You know, the the big thing with Zach going forward, what it would have to be, you know, can one, he stay healthy. And I like yeah. the fact that he's added, you know, the eight pounds of muscle. Oh, yeah. Can he, can he know this offense and process quicker? Cause that was a big issue at the beginning of last year as a right. former player, Leger, when you see Zach Wilson flying all over the country to work out with uh teammates, when you see him add this weight and Robert Salas saying he's beefy in a good way, <laughs> uh, what does that mean as a, a guy in the locker room? When you see the number two pick in the draft, seemingly taking the right steps to get better going into that second year. Yes, Jake, I love that he's taking ownership of this offseason, right? Um, not just being comfortable and saying, you know, guys, just come to me. No, nah, I'm going to fly to where my receivers are to make sure we're getting the work in, whether it's Elijah Moore and Braxton Barrios in Miami, whether it's, you know, Texas or California or Utah with, with Denzel Mims. Like, I want to make sure that we're getting this work in early and often because, you know, we're trying to change the narrative. Like, we're tired of losing here. Like, this is – I come from a winning program at BYU, you know, Elijah Moore comes from a winning program at Ole Miss. We ain't used to this youth losing. Like, this ends now. Like, so I, I love that he's taking ownership. And then the weight thing, I, I know, you know, some some of my teammates on SNY have, have you know, kind of kid about his him being undersized and everything. But I think it's major, um, him putting on that weight. I, I see my man been on that squat rack, and I love it, right? <laughs> because it, it's, it's, it's a rigorous season, Jake. Like, 17 games is a lot different from college where you're playing 12, maybe 13 with a bowl game, especially if you don't have – they were in, they didn't have a conference, so they didn't play a conference championship. So, like, 
you know, being done by November 25th compared to being done the second week of January, plus a month and a half of training camp, it's, it's a rigor, it's rigors on your body. So you got to be able to take those hits and bounce back up. Uh, and Zach took some vicious hit, hits last year. Uh, we're hoping that he doesn't have to take some of those hits this year um, because they've, you know, added to the offensive line, added to the tight end position, added some skill position receivers so he can get the ball out of his hands and not take those hits. So, but I love that he's taken over this offseason. And then also he's been dedicated in the weight room. That, that says a lot, you know, going into year two. All right. Got to ask you about this before we wrap up. What are the expectations <laughs> now? I mean, you know, I could sit here and say, I want the playoffs. This team hasn't made the playoffs in 11 years, longest drought yeah. in the NFL. But I'm also realistic knowing they're in the AFC, knowing they're a young team, second-year quarterback. But, you know, can this team win seven, eight games? Can they have a winning season? I mean, Leger, you played, man. You were on the uh, the Jets team the last time they had a winning record in 2015. Yeah. Can this team go out there and finish with a winning record? Can they play meaningful games in the month of December? What are your thoughts on the expectations? Yeah, those are the expectations, playing meaningful games in December. Now, I know it's a gauntlet to start the season, but – I always look at quarterbacks when I look at, you know, the schedule to see who we're playing. Um, you know, Lamar Jackson is usually an all Madden player. The first month of the season, I, I just don't know what it is. Like going back, he's just been an all Madden player. But I mean, this is this is football, right? The the Jets have added some really good pieces. Your job is to compete and go out there and win games. It doesn't matter who the hell is on the damn schedule, right? So I, I look at that. We've got the Ravens. That's a tough one to start. I think being at home, 9-11, you know, the fans are going to be really juiced up to play that game. A lot of excitement for what the Jets have done this offseason. Um, that can go either way. Um, you, you look at the next week, I believe it's the Cleveland Browns. We don't know what's going to happen with Deshaun Watson. Will he not be there? Will Jacoby Brissett be there? I think that's a good time to play the Cleve, Cleveland you know, Browns. Cincinnati, we beat them last year with a lesser team. Right. Now, they'll know that, so they're going to probably be a little bit more hyped than we will for that game. Because they remember how that feeling was when they, when they lost to the Jets. So they're going to come in here and they're going to be hyped up for that game. And then Pittsburgh Steelers, I, I mean, like Mike Tom is going to have his team ready, right? That defense will be good. The, there's a lot of injuries last year. They'll be back. But at the quarterback position, there's a big question mark there. So, I mean, first of all, who the hell did the schedule where we play four straight AFC North teams? Like, that's <laughs> crazy. That's absurd. I, well, I'm glad that they're playing them, you know, now instead of late December or January because New York is cold. But some of those, like Pittsburgh, like, they could clean them. They could get bad there, <laughs> like in the winter. So um, I was just weird that I, that we started the season off. Then you know, got the Miami Dolphins. So uh, I'm, this doesn't give the the Jets an excuse of man, the schedule's tough. Nah, man, you've added a lot of pieces in this offseason. It's time to go out there and compete, right? So I mean, you can't just lay down because the schedule's crazy. Like nah, and I believe everybody on this team and everybody I've talked to, they feel like they're going to surprise people. And I honestly think they're going to surprise people. I mean. I honestly think the, the win total I know was five and a half. I think the Jets should go over that easily. Honestly, I, I could see them winning seven to nine games this year. Yeah, I, I'm with you there, LeJay. What's the we'll, we'll get you out of here on this. What's the biggest thing that must happen if this team, let's say, wins nine games? Because nine games, you know, you're you're in the mix for a playoff spot up until yeah, exactly. the last week of the year. Like, what's the biggest thing that has to happen if this team can win nine games? They have, I would say they have to split the beginning of the year. Now, if you're talking about specifically players and what, what things – like this defense has to, to come along, right? Uh, offense kind of got going towards the end of last year. Uh, our run defense was atrocious last year, right? That has to significantly be better, and that's why I kind of – and me and a lot of other people kind of wanted a, a nose tackle or a D tackle somewhere in this draft. Again, Larry Ogan, Joe be still out there. Hopefully the Jets can get that deal done because I think him and Quentin Williams and then you got Sheldon Rankins and – Solomon Thomas's backups, I'll take that all day, you know, and then you have a nice rotation. Uh, I think our run defense would be significantly better with uh, Jermaine Johnson and John Franklin Myers on the outside. Um, Quincy Williams taking another you know, leap. And then Quan, I heard Quan Alexander's come. He'd be really good to bring in on third down. He's familiar with this defense, played with Robert Sala in San Francisco. But CJ, you know, CJ Mosley's getting up there in age, but he's got the, the mental you know, mentality. So when you lose a step, your mind has to take over, and that's what we're seeing from C.J. Mosley. He can, you know, decipher plays before they happen. He knows how to, to get a step on the offensive line, trying to block them. And then on third down, we have to win, right? Um, people talked about, you know, Sauce Garner maybe not being a perfect fit because he's more of a man-to-man -man guy. But if you watch how the defense has kind of changed over your, the years – Robert Sala likes to blitz on third down and go man coverage on the outside. So that's where Sauce Garner is going to be big. DJ Reed, I mean, 
I know a lot of people were sort of, sort of talking about him before the Sauce Garner pick, but don't forget about him, man. Like, Sauce Garner's not just going to go against the number one receiver every play. Like, DJ Reed is a dog. Like, put some respect on this man's name. There's a reason why he's getting $11 million a year now. I know he's not the biggest guy in stature, but this guy is a hell of a competitor. I just love the way he plays the game of football. And Jordan Jordan Whitehead, and we talked about, you know, Lamar Jackson in week one, he's going to be monumental in that game. Like, the best run defending safety in the league. Love the, the way he plays the game, plays with attitude, is aggressive. Um and at the safety position, I was hoping that we maybe drafted a safety too, but we brought a lot of guys back. So I think between Will Parks, uh, Pinnock, and uh, Ashton Davis, I think Silas Comfortable, one of those guys, you know, potentially. And Mark LaMarcus Joyner, if he's healthy, one of those guys being the starter next to Jordan Whitehead. And I think this defense will look a lot different than they did last year. Leger, you're one of the hardest working guys now in sports media. You're on SNY talking about the Jets. You're on CBS HQ talking about the NFL. And now... You're a big time national radio star on Sirius XM Mad Dog Sports Radio. Plug the show, man. I want our audience to be able to find yeah. you on the radio now. So, yeah, every day, Monday through Friday, 7 to 9 Eastern PM, I am the new host of I Am Athlete Tonight. It is a sports show on Mad Dog Radio, sports radio, as my guy Jake Asman said, channel 82. Um, or you can download the SXM app and listen to it there or any any podcast apple podcast anywhere you listen to your podcast and we have a great time man it's like it's like the locker room right so i have co-hosts but i don't call them co-hosts they're teammates right because it's the locker room so we have Lashawn shady mccoy brandon marshall antoine walker adam pacman jones brandon flowers dr Chantel trimeter who was a WNBA player and we rotate you know the you know the 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 teammate chair constantly so we can keep it fresh there's a lot of guys that have you know and women that have uh different opinions man and it's just great um it's just again it's like locker room talk it's not like it's work we just go in there we have a good time and we talk about sports and you guys gotta check us out man and we're gonna actually start taking callers soon within like the next week or two so it's gonna be fun to be able to interact with some of the fans and again it's just it's it's a lot different from typical sports shows because it's run by athletes, right? Everybody on the show is an athlete, including myself, and I'm the host. So you get, you know, unique perspectives on certain sports topics, how they related to us in our, you know, real life, you know, while we were playing the game that we love. So I think that's the difference between us and, and other sports shows. It's not a typical, you know, formatted sports show. It's like just, you know, guys chilling in the locker room and having a good time. Love that. You got to keep Brandon Marshall in line, though, right, Leger? I mean, he, oh, he, he, man, he man, yeah, yeah. It, like I said, when you're driving the ship with a whole bunch of, you know, alpha personalities, <laughs> it, it, it could be mu a bit much, but it's so fun, man. It's fun being able to steer that ship and then and, and the conversations we have and to hear some of my teammates on there talk about certain things that I didn't even know about them. It's, it's amazing, man. Leger, you're the absolute best. So glad we could get you back on the show. I know Jeff fans love hearing from you, so thanks so much for coming on. Continued success in your media career, and look forward to continuing listening to your brand-new sports show on Mad Dog Sports Radio. Appreciate you, Jake. He's Leger Doosable. My name is Jake Asman. I hope everyone has a fantastic weekend. Before we wrap up, just a reminder, we're still doing our Jets jersey giveaway for the next couple of days. If you sign up at busr.com slash Asman and make the minimum deposit, you're automatically entered in the Jets jersey giveaway courtesy of BUSR. Jets jersey of your choice from the pro shop. Shout out to Sergio. He won the first contest. He's got a Sauce Gardner jersey being sent to him as we speak. If you want in, now's the chance. It's BUSR.com slash Asman. They're my official uh, sports book, so start betting on sports today at BUSR.com slash Asman. Thanks again to Leger Doosable for joining the show. I'm taping this, so this is dropping live to tape. Friday morning. Hope everyone has a fantastic weekend, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Go Jets. Have a great weekend, everybody.